The title of these talks that I'm giving here is Mind Over Mind. And I'm going into all the various problems which have to do with the control of the mind. And so I might introduce what I'm going to say by saying it from different points of view. For example, if you're interested in communications, it will be the problem of feedback. Or if I may put it in theological terms, how does man follow the will of God if the will of man is perverse? The theologians say, uh, you cannot do this without having divine grace or the power to follow the will of God. How then do you get grace? Why is grace given to some and not to others? If I cannot follow the will of God by my own effort because my will is selfish, how will my will, which is selfish, be transformed into an unselfish will? If I cannot do it because I am already the selfish will, then grace must do it. If grace has not already done it, why not? Because I didn't accept it, but by definition I had no power to accept it because my will was selfish. Must I then become a Calvinist and say that only those people who are predestined to receive grace will be able to live the good life? Then we come back to the inadmissible position that people who live evil lives and do not get grace because they are not predestined to it out of the infinite wisdom of the Godhead, then God himself must be held responsible for their evil deeds. And so that is a nice little tangle. If I put this in uh, the language of Oriental philosophy and religion, it would be something like this. The Buddha said that wisdom must come only from the abandonment of selfish craving or desire. One who abandons that desire attains nirvana, which is supreme peace, liberation. Nirvana means, in Sanskrit, blow out. That is, exhale the breath. The opposite desire is to breathe in. Now, if you breathe in and hold it, you lose your breath. But if you breathe out, it comes back to you. So the principle here is, if you want life, don't cling to it. Let go. But the problem is, if I desire not to desire, is that not already desire? How can I desire not to desire? How can I surrender myself when myself is precisely an urge to hold on, to cling, to cling to life to continue to survive. I can see rationally that by clinging to myself, I may strangle myself. I may be like a person who has a bad habit as a result of which he is committing suicide. And he knows that, but can't give it up because the means of death are so sweet. So it all comes down to this basic question that human beings have for a long, long time been concerned about transforming their minds. Is there any way in which one's mind can be transformed? Or is it simply a process which is nothing more than a vicious circle? I could ask, why have you come here this afternoon? 
What were you looking for? Would it be too presumptuous of me to say that you were looking for help? That you hoped you would hear somebody who had something to say that would be of help and relevance to you as members of a world which is running into the most intense difficulty. A world beset by a complex of problems, any one of which would be bad enough. But when you add together all the great political, social and ecological problems with which we are faced, they are appalling. And one naturally says, the reason why we are in such a mess is not simply that we have wrong systems for doing things, whether they be technological, political or religious, but we have the wrong people. The systems may be all right, but they are in the wrong hands because we are all in various ways self-seeking, lacking in wisdom, lacking in courage, afraid of death, afraid of pain, unwilling really to cooperate with others, unwilling to be open to others. And we all think that's too bad. It's me that's wrong. And if only I could be the right person. Is this man going to tell me something that will help me to change myself so that I will be a more creative and cooperative member of the human race. I would like to improve. So in so many people's minds and from so many different angles, there is this urgent feeling that I must improve me. And this is critically important because it's obvious that, at least it's superficially obvious, that the way things are, we are going to hell fast. Now in this question, can I improve me? There is the obvious difficulty that if I am in need of improvement, the person who's going to do the improving is the one who needs to be improved. And there immediately we have a vicious circle. All right, you want grace. Well, ask God, maybe he'll give it to you. And the theologian will tell you, yes, God gives his grace freely. He gives it to all because he loves all. It's here like the air. All you have to do is receive it. Or a more orthodox, a Catholic Christian would say, all you have to do is to be baptized, to take the holy sacrament of the altar, the bread and wine, the body and blood of Christ, and there is the grace right there. And it's given by these simple physical means so that it's uh, very easily and readily available. Well, a lot of people got baptized and it doesn't always take. People fall from grace. Why do they? You see, we're just talking about the same old problem, but we've put it a step up, but it's the same problem. How? Can I improve myself? Was the first problem. The second problem is, how can I accept grace? They're both the same problem. Because you've got to make a move, which will put yourself out of your own control, into the control of a better. If you don't believe in the Christian kind of a God, you can believe in the Hindu kind of a God, who is your inner self. You see, you've got a lower self, which you can call your ego. That's that little scoundrelous fellow. It's always out for me. But behind the ego, there is the Atman, the inner self, the inward light, as Quakers would call it, the real self, the spirit, which is substantially identical with God. So you've got to meditate in such a way that you identify with your higher self. Now, how do you do that? Well. You start by watching all your thoughts very carefully, watching your feelings, watching your emotions, 
so that you begin to build up a sense of separation between the watcher and what is watched. So that you are, as it were, no longer carried away by your own stream of consciousness. You remain the witness, impassively, impartially, suspending judgment and watching it all go on. That seems to be something like progress. At least you're taking an objective view of what is going on. You are beginning to be in a position to control it, but just wait a minute. Who is this self behind the self, the watching self? Can you watch that one? It's interesting if you do, because you find out, of course, that this is just as the problem of grace is nothing more than a transposition of the first problem. How am I to be unselfish? By my own power. It becomes how am I to get grace by my own power. So in the same way we find that the watching self or the observing self behind all our thoughts and feelings is itself a thought. That is to say, when the police enter a house in which there are thieves, the thieves go up from the ground floor to the first floor. When the police arrive on the first floor, the thieves have gone up to the second. And so to the third and finally out to the roof. And so when the ego is about to be unmasked, it immediately identifies with the higher self. It goes up a level. Because the religious game is simply a refined and highbrow version of the ordinary game. How can I outwit me? How can I one-up me? So, if I find, for example, that in the quest for pleasure, the ordinary pleasures of the world, food, sex, power, possessions, all this becomes a drag, and I think, no, it isn't there, so I go in for the arts, literature, poetry, music, and I absorb myself in, the, in those pleasures, and after a while, they aren't the answer, so I go to psychoanalysis, you see, and uh, then I found out that's not the answer. I go to religion. But I'm still seeking what I was seeking when I wanted candy bars. I want to get that goodie. Only I see now that of course it's not going to be a material goodie. All material goodies fall apart. But maybe there's a spiritual goodie that's not going to fall apart. But in that quest, the quest is not different from the quest for the candy bar. Same old story. Only you've refined the candy bar and made it abstract and holy and blessed and so on. So it is with the higher self. The higher self's your old ego. And you sure hope it is eternal. Indestructible and all wise. But then the great problem is how to get that higher self working. How, how does it make any difference to what you do and what you think? I know all kinds of people who've got this higher self going, practicing their yoga. But they're just like ordinary people, sometimes a little worse. And uh, they can fool themselves. They can say, for example, well, my point of view in religion is very liberal. I believe that all religions have uh, divine revelation in them. But I don't understand the way you people fight about it. You fight and say that uh, we, um, Jehovah's Witnesses, have the real religion. Others say, well, we Roman Catholics have it. And the Muslims say, no, it is in the Quran. And this is the right way. And somebody else gets up, and he may be a rather highbrow Catholic, and say, 
Well, God has given the Spirit through all the traditions, but ours is the most refined and mature. And then somebody comes along and says, well, as I said, they're all equally revelations of the divine. And in seeing this, of course, I'm much more tolerant than you are. <laughs> you see how that game is going to work? Yeah, I could take this position. Supposing you regard me as some sort of a guru. And you know how gurus hate each other. They're always putting each other down. And I could say, well, I don't put other gurus down. See, that outwits all of them. <laughs> See, we're always doing that. We're always finding a way to be one up. And by the most incredibly subtle means. So you see that, you see? And you say, I realize I'm always doing that. Now tell me, how do I not do that? I say, why do you want to know? <laughs> well, I'd be better that way. Yeah, but why do you want to be better? You see, the reason you want to be better is the reason why you aren't. Shall I put it like that? We aren't better because we want to be. Because the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Because all the do-gooders in the world, whether they're doing good for others or doing it for themselves, are troublemakers. On the basis of kindly let me help you or you'll drown, said the monkey, putting the fish safely up a tree. <laughs> we white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, British, German, American, have been on a rampage for the past hundred or more years to improve the world. We have given the benefits of our culture, our religion, our technology to everybody, except perhaps the Australian Aborigines. And we have insisted that they receive the benefits of our culture, even our political styles, our democracy. You better be Democrat, or we'll shoot you. And having conferred these blessings all over the place, we wonder why everybody hates us. See, because sometimes doing good to others, and even doing good to oneself, is amazingly destructive. Because it's full of conceit. How do you know what's good for other people? How do you know what's good for you? If you say uh, you want to improve, then you ought to know what's good for you. But obviously you don't. Because if you did, you would be improved. So we don't know. It's like the problem of geneticists, which they face today. I went to a meeting of geneticists not so long ago where they gathered in a group of philosophers and theologians and said, now look here, we need help. We now are on the verge of figuring out how to breed any kind of human character. Uh, we would want to have. We can give you saints, philosophers, scientists, great politicians, anything you want, just tell us what kind of human beings ought we to breed. So, I said, how will those of us who are genetically unregenerate make up our minds what genetically generate people might be? because I'm afraid very much that our selection of virtues may not work. It may be like, for example, this new kind of high yield grain which is made and uh, which is becoming ecologically destructive. When we interfere with the processes of nature and breed efficient plants and efficient animals, there's always some way in which we have to pay for it. And I can well see that eugenically produced human beings might be dreadful. I just want to be with you right now. We could have 
a plague of virtuous people. Do you realize that? Any animal considered in itself is virtuous, does its thing, but in crowds they're awful. Like a crowd of ants or locusts on the rampage. They're all perfectly good animals, but it's just too much. I could imagine a perfectly pestiferous mass of a million saints. <laughs> so I said to these people, look, there's the only thing you can do. Just be sure that a vast variety of human beings is maintained. Don't please breed us down to a few excellent types. Excellent for what? We never know how circumstances are going to change and how our need for different kinds of people changes. At one time, we may need very individualistic and aggressive people. At another time, we may need very cooperative, teamworking people. At another time, we may need people who are full of interest in dexterous manipulation of the external world. At another time, we may need people who explore into their own psychology and are introspective. There is no knowing. But the more varieties and the more skills we have, obviously, the better. So, you see, here again, the problem comes out in genetics. We do not really know how to interfere with the way the world is. The way the world actually is, is an enormously complex interrelated organism. The same problem arises in medicine because the body is a very complexly interrelated organism. And if you look at the body in a superficial way, you may see there's something wrong with it. Here's chicken pox. And there's spots that itch that come all out all over the place. Well, you might say, well, spots are there, cut them off. So you kill the bug. Well, then you find you've got real problems. Because you have to introduce some bugs to kill the bug. It's like bringing rabbits into Australia. And that starts going all over the place and getting out of hand. But then you think, well, now, wait a minute. It wasn't the bugs in the blood. There are bugs all over the place. What was wrong with this person that his blood system suddenly became vulnerable to those particular bugs? His resistance wasn't up. Therefore, what you should have given him was not an antibiotic, but vitamins. Okay, so we're going to build up his resistance. But resistance to what? You may build up resistance to this and this and this class of bugs, but then there's another one that loves that situation and comes right in. See, we always look at the human being medically in bits and pieces because we have heart specialists, lung specialists, bone specialists, nerve specialists, and so on. And they each see the human being from their point of view. There are a few generalists but they realize the human body is so complicated that no one mind can understand it. And furthermore, supposing we do succeed in healing all these people of their diseases, what do we then do about the population problem? I mean, we've stopped cholera, the black bubonic plague, we're getting the better of tuberculosis, we may fix cancer and heart disease. Then what will people die of? Well, then let's go on living be enormous quantities of us. Then we have to fix this birth thing. Pills for everybody. Then we find what are the effects, the side effects of those pills? What are the psychological effects upon men and women of not breeding uh, children in the usual way? We don't know. And what seems a good thing today, or yesterday, like DDT, turns out tomorrow to have been a disaster. What seemed in the moral and spiritual sphere too, like great virtues in times past, are easily seen today as hideous evils. Let's take, for example, the Inquisition. In its own day, among Catholics, the Holy Inquisition was regarded as we today regard the practice of psychiatry. You, you see, you, you feel that in curing a person of cancer, almost anything is justified. 
the most complex operations, the most weird surgery. People suspended for days and days on end on the end of tubes with X-ray penetration, burning. Or people undergoing shock treatment, people locked in the colorless, monotonous corridors of mental institutions. In all good faith, they knew that witchcraft and heresy were terrible things, awful plagues, imperiling people's souls forever and ever. So any means were justified to cure people of heresy. We don't change. We're doing the same thing today, but under different names. We can look back at those people and see how evil that was but we can't see it in ourselves. So therefore, beware of virtue. Lao Tzu, the Chinese philosopher, said, the highest virtue is not virtue, and therefore really is virtue. But inferior virtue cannot let go of being virtuous, and therefore is not virtue. Translated uh, in more of a periphrastic way, the highest virtue is not conscious of itself as virtue, and therefore really is virtue. Lower virtue is so self-conscious that it's not virtue. In other words, when you breathe, you don't congratulate yourself on being virtuous. But breathing is a great virtue. It's living. When you come out with beautiful eyes, blue or brown or green as the case may be, you don't congratulate yourself for having grown one of the most fabulous jewels on earth. So it's just eyes. And you don't account it a virtue to see, to entertain the miracles of color and form. You say, well, that's just... But that's real virtue. Virtue in the sense, the old sense of the word, a strength, is when we talk about the healing virtue of a plant. That's real virtue. But the other virtues are stuck on. They are ersatz, they are imitation virtues. And they usually create trouble. Because more diabolical things are done in the name of righteousness and be assured that everybody of whatever nationality or political frame of mind or religion always goes to war with a sense of complete rightness. The other side is the devil. Our opponents, whether in China or Russia or Vietnam, have the same feeling of righteousness about what they're doing as we have on our side. And a plague on both houses. Because, as Confucius said, the goody goodies are the thieves of virtue. Which is the form of our own proverb the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So, in a way, the moral or the immoral of. <laughs> these considerations is that if you are really aware of your own inner workings you will realize there's nothing you can do to improve yourself because you don't know what better is in any case and you who will do the improving are the one who needs to be improved and this also goes for society. We can change society. We can get enormous enthusiasm going out of the idea that there is a revolution afoot and that this revolution is going to set everything to right. Do you know a revolution that ever set anything to right? Whether the revolution came from the left wing or from the right wing, the best forms of government that have ever existed in the world are those which muddled through. 
where they didn't have any very clear uh, setup of control, but they muddled along. A kind of what I'll call controlled anarchy seems to work out better than anything else. When we have a great system and great power to put it into effect, there is always more violence, more bloodshed, more trouble. It makes no difference whether it be Chairman Mao or Adolf Hitler. So, what instead, therefore, if we see that you can't outwit yourself, you can't be, shall I say, unselfconscious on purpose, you can't be designedly spontaneous, and you cannot be genuinely loving by intending to love. Either you love someone or you don't. If you pretend to love a person, you deceive them and build up reasons for resentment. So you say, well, I ought to be honest. That's, that's the beginning of, oh, so many lies you can't imagine. It's like when I hear a lot said about love, the big love thing on the way. Everybody's got to love everybody. Or he sings songs about love. Do you know what I do? I buy a gun and bar my door. Because I know there's a storm of hypocrisy brewing. So, let's look at this thing from another point of view, which you will at first think highly depressing. Let's supposing we can't do anything to change ourselves. Suppose we're stuck with it. Now that is the, the worst thing an American audience can hear. There's no way of improving yourself. Because every kind of culture in this country is dedicated to self-improvement. Just take jogging, that deplorable practice. It's a very nice thing to run and to go dancing across the hills uh, at a fast speed. But these joggers like chunk, 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 chunk shaking their bones and rattling their brains with running on their heels and because there's a grimness about it it's determinately good for you see why do you go to school <laughs> no 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 now wait a minute you may not clap when i'm through <laughs> there's only one reason for going to school and that is that somebody's got something here, whether it's a professor or a library, that you want to find out. That you are incredibly interested in um, <laughs> how to write Chinese characters or how to understand botany. And you would like to know. You're just interested in flowers. And you would like to find out everything there is to be known about them. That's the point of coming here. Or you might like to know how to practice yoga. The course is now being offered at UCLA on Kundalini Yoga for credit. <laughs> Pretty funny when I think back 10 years. But the whole point of coming to school is that you're interested in something. You don't come to improve yourself. But the trouble is that the schools got the wrong idea. They gave people honors for learning. And the reward for studying French should be the ability to speak French and enjoy reading French and having fun with French people. But when you get a degree for it, then the degree becomes the point in a game of one-upmanship. And of course, one-upmanship is the main business of the educational uh, community today. You learn all the rules of how to be a good professor. It's instructive to go to a, prof a professional professor's meeting. In my field, which is philosophy, you go to a congress of philosophers, and you'll find when they all get together in the bar or in the restaurant and somebody's room, the one thing they don't talk about is philosophy. <laughs> it is very bad form indeed. 
to show interest in philosophy among your colleagues. The same is exactly true in clergy gatherings. They don't talk about religion. What they both talk about is politics, church politics and academic politics, because it's bad form to be brilliant on the faculty, because it outclasses your colleagues. Therefore, faculty people tend to cultivate a studied mediocrity. And you've got to watch out for that. I mean, if you get mobs of students coming to your lectures, you get pretty black looks from your colleagues. And then, of course, there's a whole world of one-upmanship in research and publication of learned papers. How many, what's the relative quantity of footnotes to basic text, and footnotes on footnotes? and the various ways of making your bibliography painfully accurate. And, and it's endless. But you see, what it is, it's scholarship about scholarship, and not scholarship. Just as learning, because learning is good for you, is irrelevant to learn. The whole idea of improving yourself by learning is irrelevant to the learning process. And in the same way, doing business, is doing business. Doing business, such as uh, manufacturing uh, clothes, is a very good thing to do. I could conceive that it would be extremely enjoyable, something one could be very proud of, to make good clothes. Of course, you need to sell them because you need to eat. But to make clothes to make money raises another question. Because then your interest is not in making clothes making money and then you're going to cheat on the clothes and then you, you get an awful lot of money and you don't know what to do with it you can't you can't eat ten roasts of beef in one day you can't live in six houses at once you can't drive three Rolls Royces at the same time what are you to do well you can just go make more money you put your money back invest it in something else and it'll make more and you don't give a damn how it's made, so long as they make it. You don't care if they foul the rivers, put oil fumes throughout the air everywhere, kill off all the fish. So, not, so long as you see these figures happening, you're not aware of anything else. So, you see, you went out to do a self-improvement thing. Making money, you see, is a measure of improvement. A measure of your economic worthwhileness. Or at least that's what it's supposed to be, it isn't anything of the kind. But you went out, in other words, for the status instead of for the actuality. So if, in other words, you, you do an art, you're a musician, why do you play music? The only re reason for playing music is to enjoy it. Hurry to think you know what it is. In other words, people look at the, say, oh, that's the external world. Forget facts. Forget oh, logic. how do you know? Forget everything that seems. The whole thing, from a neurological point of view, is a happening in your head. Trust. Believe. That you think there is something outside the skull is a notion in your nervous system. There may or may not be, but it's a notion in your nervous system. You think this is the material world. Well, that's somebody's philosophical idea. Or maybe you're, you think it's spiritual. That too is somebody's philosophical idea. This real world is not spiritual. It is not material. The real world is simply... So, could we look at things in that way? Without, as it were, fixing labels and names and gradations and judgments on everything. But watch what happens. Watch what we do. Now, you see, if you do that, you do at least give yourself a chance. And it may be that when you are in this way freed from busybodiness and being out to improve everything, that your own nature will begin to take care of itself because you're not getting in the way of yourself all the time. You will begin to find out 
that the great things that you do are really happenings. For example, no great genius can explain how he does it. Yes, he said, I have learned a technique to express myself. Because I had something in me that had to come out, I had to know how to give it out. So if I were a musician, I had to learn how music is produced. That means learning to use an instrument or learning a technique of musical notation or whatever it may be. If I want to describe something, I have to learn a language so that others can understand me. I, I need a technique. But then beyond that, I'm afraid I can't tell you how it was that I used that technique to express this mysterious thing I wanted to show you. If we could tell people that, we would have schools where we would infallibly train musical geniuses, scientific uh, miracle minds. And there would be so many of them, we, we, we wouldn't know what to do with them. Geniuses would be a dime a dozen. And then we would say, well, these people are, after all, not very ingenious. You know, PhDs, how many of them are there? Because what is fascinating always about genius is the fellow does something we can't understand. He surprises us. But you see, just in the same way, we cannot understand our own brains. Neurology knows relatively little about the brain, which is only to say that the brain is a lot smarter than neurology. Yes, it, yeah, there is this, which can perform all these extraordinary intellectual and cultural miracles. But we don't know how we did it. We did. We didn't have some campaign to have an improved brain over the monkeys or whatever may be our ancestors. It happened. And all growth, you see, is fundamentally something that happens. But for it to happen, two things are important. And the first is, as I said, you must have the technical ability to express what happens. And secondly, you must get out of your own way. But right at the bottom of the whole problem of control is how am I to get out of my own way? And if I showed you a system, let's all practice getting out of our own way. It would turn into another form of self-improvement. Here's the dynamics of this thing. And we find this problem, you see, repeatedly throughout the entire history of human spirituality. In the phraseology of Zen Buddhism, you cannot get this by thinking. You cannot attain to it by not thinking. It is only, you see, as you... as getting out of your own way ceases to be a matter of choice, and you see that there's nothing else for you to do. When you see, in other words, that doing something about your situation is not going to help you. When you see equally that trying not to do anything about it is not going to help you. Where are you? Where do you stand? You're nonplussed. And you are simply reduced to watching. Now you may say, I need some help in this process, and therefore I am going to find someone else to help me. It may be a therapist. It may be a clergyman. It may be a guru. It may be any kind of person who teaches a technique of self-improvement. Now, how will you know whether this person is able to teach you? How can you judge, for example, whether a psychotherapist is a effective or just a charlatan? How can you judge whether a guru is himself spiritually wise or merely a good chatterbox? 
Well, of course, you ask your friends, you ask his other students or patients, and they're all, of course, enthusiastic. You have to be enthusiastic when you've bought something expensive. If you bought an automobile which turned out to be a lemon, it's very difficult to admit that it was a lemon and that you were fooled. And it's the same when you buy a religion or an expensive operation. But what people do not sufficiently realize is that when you pick an authority, whether it's a psychotherapeutic one or a religious one, you chose it. In other words, that this fellow or this book or this system is the right one is your opinion. And how are you competent to judge? After all, if you're saying to this other person or other source, I think you are the authority, that's your opinion. So you cannot really judge whether an authority is a sound authority unless you yourself are a sound authority. Otherwise you may just be being fooled. You may say, for example, I believe that the Bible is the word of God. All right, that's your opinion. I know the Bible says it's the word of God, but it's your opinion that the Bible is not lying. The church says the Bible is the word of God, but it's your opinion that the church is right. You cannot escape from that situation. It's your opinion. So you see, when you select an authority who will help you to improve yourself, it's like hiring the police out of your tax money and putting them in charge of seeing that you obey the law. I mean, can't you take care of yourselves? I mean, is this the land of the free and the home of the brave, or isn't it? But you see, nobody seems to want to be in charge of themselves because they feel they can't do it. As St. Paul said, to will is present with me. But how to do good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not, and the evil that I would not, that I do. <laughs> so, there at once, we, we are in difficulty. Because trying to improve yourself is like trying to lift yourself up into the air by tugging at your own bootstraps. And it can't be done. Now, there are all sorts of ways in which religious people try to explain that it can be done. I referred already to the grace of God. They say, no, you can't do the job yourself because the improving you is the one that needs to be improved. Therefore, you have to say, God, help me. Now, of course, that God exists is your opinion. That God will answer your prayer is your opinion. And your idea of God is your idea of God. If you bought somebody else's script, you bought it. Maybe your mother and father talked to you about God in a very impressive way. But basically, you bought their idea. And if you're a father yourself, I'm a grandfather now, I've got five grandchildren. And I know I'm as stupid as my own grandfather must have been. Yeah, I am one. I sit there in the position which they look at. Think, oh, wowee, that's an important man. <laughs> I know that. I'm just like anyone else. So I hope my children are not believing things on my authority because it's always their authority. If I look impressive and make big noises at them, they've just been taken in.